We want to make sure you're, you're aware of all this. On mission four, when we got to the surface, Scott was piloting, he heard a really loud bang. Um, not, a, not a soothing sound. No. Um, but on the surface, and as the you know, Tim and PH will, will uh, attest, almost every deep diving sub makes a noise at some point. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Well, more drama and mishaps are coming out of the woodwork. The Titan submersible was by definition a cylinder, a tube, a pipe, a short tunnel. Sat inside, some saw light at the end of that tunnel, while others saw the darkness of the tunnel itself. A darkness that creaked, crackled and during 2021 made loud bangs. It's when we examine Titanic actor Bill Paxton's attitude to going down in a submersible that we begin to fully appreciate the context. How should you feel about this? What is a normal uh, display of emotion? But each dive, I had to kind of look myself in the mirror and go, okay, are you, are you ready for this? <sighs> Pretty deep. Elsewhere in that clip, like PH, Paxton says, if things go wrong at the depth of Titanic, it's going to happen so quickly, meaning death, you won't even know it. It's such a strange attitude. I mean, who buys a car? And when they ask about the airbags, they ask about safety. Someone says, well, you know, if something doesn't work, it'll be all over before you know it. Asked if he had serious doubts about doing it, Paxton emphatically says he did. He jumped at it, but was simultaneously thrust into a kind of existential crisis. He talks about a 13-hour dive in a Russian sub going down 2.5 miles to a place where the light of the sun has never reached. And then he admits, as you just heard, each time I had to do a dive, I had to look myself in the mirror and say, okay, are you ready for this? If you think about it, Pax Paxton's spectrum of emotion is normal and was an enormous hurdle Stockton Rush had to overcome, which is why he would go personally to these people and, and do the sales pitch and convince them. Because I think for most people, by far the majority, there is going to be a sense of anxiety. There is going to be a sense of claustrophobia and fear. I don't think it's so strange that so many have climbed Everest compared with so few getting into what feels like a metal coffin and going down to see a graveyard. Although I suppose on Everest you don't necessarily see what's in front of you in a widescreen format. Your vision is also kind of a frost line portal. But now there are some additional horror stories we've, ever, we've also heard. Now, can you imagine being near the bottom and the lights go out? You've got no communications, the lights aren't on, and you're told, well, just sleep. Ironically, that's one of the same things that happens on Everest when there's not a weather window and you're in the death zone and you're in your tent at Camp 4. Your expedition leader probably would also say to you, just sleep. Would you be able to sleep? In this episode, I want to unpack why the whole experience is actually quite a labyrinth. It's not actually as simple as how dangerous is it or hearing a noise and deciding, well, that's, that's it. I'm not going to take part. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that. But before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Thanks to the, thanks and welcome to the thousands of you who have subscribed. I'm going to be doing many more episodes, so if you're interested in the subject matter and it's really we're going to go very, very deep into this whole story. If you're enjoying this episode, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. So, you know, even if Paxton's hesitation was normal, it was normal in the context of Cameron's safe and certified submersible, as was Cameron himself. Cameron, you kind of get a sense of reliability and trustworthiness and sensibility from him. You looked at uh, the submarine, you looked at Cameron, and although it was still daunting, you at least trusted both. With Ocean Gate, even if you overcame your natural inhibitions, weren't there other hurdles to deal with? Things like experimental craft, Stockton's persona you know really you want to talk safety with a daredevil who tells you if you want safety don't get out of bed i mean wasn't stockton rush a wobbling jaw that's sort of cowboy slang for a big talker 
So how was one really to know that one submersible was a death trap while another wasn't? And is that what it really came down to? I mean, how was one to know what to make of the submersible being towed by the polar prince? If you saw that firsthand, what would you make of that? I mean, it's like pushing a pram with a baby inside onto a trampoline while three teenagers are aggressively jumping on it. What are you supposed to think about that? Did it require critical thinking? Did it require polygraph machine or plain old meat and potatoes common sense to make the final decision? If it's you, is it going to be a go, no go for launch? Now, you might be sitting there thinking, looking at your phone or looking at your television thinking, you know what, I think this would be quite a simple thing for me. And this episode is to show you it might not be so simple, especially if you are emotionally invested. But let's start with the the common sense response. And we see the common sense response from Josh Gates, and some people would have the common sense response. Josh Gates said on the 21st of June, to those asking, Titan did not perform well on my dive. And ultimately, I walked away from a huge opportunity to film Titanic due to my safety concerns with the Ocean Gate platform. He goes on to say there's more to the history and design of Titan that has not been made public, much of it concerning. And so I do think a lot of sensible people would be put off of Titan simply because of its obvious simplicity. They would say something, there's not enough here, I'm I'm not convinced. I mean, if nothing else, there's no provision even for seats. And that then brings us to the next level. So the first group of potential uh, passengers would say, sorry, this doesn't make sense, and they would sensibly leave. But then you would be left with another group of people, the, those uh, that are chasing, those, those are, that, are eventually, that are essentially adventure seekers, that want risk that are making a calculation of risk versus reward that's different to the rest of us. And clearly, risk would be something that certain individuals would basically take as a given. They would say, of course it's a risk. For example, longtime Titanic superfan Renato Rojas, 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 I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, but she is someone who's actually quite familiar now to the uh, folks who went down with Ocean Gate. And she had a good, or she had a, yeah, I guess a good experience. Basically a successful adventure. She, she got down to Titanic and that was good enough for her. Now, if you think about it, if the risk of getting into submersible wasn't bad enough, imagine doing it during COVID. Imagine not only having to get into something that makes you a little claustrophobic, You've got to mask up with four other people and have your mask on for about 10 hours or so. One imagines all of this would be no problem for an adventure junkie like Renata, where someone else would go running and screaming at the mere thought of something like that. And that then brings us to this whole idea of you are made aware of, this is kind of like the third dimension, you told about battery death. You told about loud bangs in 2021. You you are told in a presentation in known certain terms, this is what happened. And what is what is actually happening is around you, there's basically a sense of people telling stories about adventures that they willingly volunteered for, put themselves through, came back and survived. And, and that is part of the point, is to be able to come back as this hero as this conquering hero and you dealt with your fear, you dealt with the situation that was presented to you, you know, the cards that were played, you you handled them and you came out and so you're a hero. And so if there isn't some kind of difficulty, well, then you don't really have such a great story to tell. It's a little bit like I've done whitewater rafting and, you know, if you don't fall into the river, well, can you really say it was that dangerous. Maybe you want to fall into the river and then struggle out of it. According to the Daily Mail, quote, a man who was once a passenger of the Titan claimed that Ocean Gate CEO Stockton Rush suggested the crew sleep on the vessel overnight while they were stuck at the bottom of the Atlantic. 
Jaden Pan, I think he's a videographer, he went down on the 2021 expedition. Well, that expedition took a terrifying turn, according to the Daily Mail, when Titan's battery died just over two hours into its descent to the Titanic. In a documentary with the BBC, I think it's called Take Me to the Titanic, you basically get a sense of Rush again just dismissing concerns. The videographer says that he thought that Rush was joking when he heard those words. We had discussed actually staying, just sleeping at the bottom of the ocean in the submersible. When the issue of loud bangs coming from the flawed and failing carbon fiber hull were mentioned, apparently when Scott Griffith, the director of quality assurance, was piloting the craft, Stockton Rush noted, well, it's not a soothing sound, but almost every deep sea sub makes a noise at some point. And then he pointed to P.H. Nagule saying that he can attest that this was normal. So one wonders if your hull is making loud cracking noises, if you Hearing the integrity being tested, being weakened, at what point do you, do you pay attention? Do you take corrective action only when you see a crack or when the ship starts leaking? One wonders whether on June 18th, who heard or saw something? Who realized things were serious enough to abort? Was it PH? Was it Hamish? Or was it the CEO? And so you might say, if you sitting there and they're saying, well, you know what, we heard a loud bang and the battery went down in, in that particular mission, you'd, you'd say, I'm out. But it's actually more complicated than that. It certainly is for some people. By now, if I've done my job, it should be clear that it's not so cut and dried whether doing something in the spirit of adventure is sensible or not, risky but worth a risk, or is it reckless? In this arena, which is the urge to adventure, we move into an area that is beyond the purview of science and of science officers like Spock. We're going into an area of human emotion where hubris can and does and should override common sense. When an Olympic athlete strives for a gold medal or a world record, common sense tells him it probably can't be done. Hubris is how what seems impossible, at least improbable, happens. The risk is, uh, well, the risk in this context is no longer an equation of science, but a risk equation involving known risk factors and unknown risk factors, as well as one's own risk appetite and, I guess, intuition. In practical terms, when you enter the Titan, you're also told that over time, puddles of water will form from condensation at the freezing depths surrounding Titanic. You're told, wear warm socks and don't step in the puddles. Not everyone is cut out for the unpleasantness or the discomfort of adventure, and often part of the package is risk. It comes with the territory. Thus far in our analysis, we've looked at the science and the material side of things. Now we're going to look at the people, the personalities, the personal histories, and the thing that science alone cannot account for, human emotion in the face of danger, or for the lack of a better word, heroism. And so look out for my next video dealing with this Nagale's warning before the dive. How were they supposed to respond to it? How did they respond to it? And are we beginning to understand that response? Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you.